This is the optimal taxation panel. This panel is uh, regarding what uh, are the best forms of taxation and uh, how we can use them to avoid a uh, housing crisis, future technological displacement problems, or, or um, you know, inequality. And uh, each panelist will have 10 minutes to introduce themselves and their, uh, for their ideas on this topic. And uh, let's get started. So uh, let's go from left to right. So uh, Fred will go first. Good afternoon. Is this working? Hello. Well, uh, I'm Fred Fulvery. I teach uh, economics at uh, San Jose State University. Now, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the big problems that people are talking about is income inequality and, and the unaffordability of housing. And <clears throat> so a lot of people talk about, you know, what the 1% or what the 10th percent, but very few are investigating what's the cause of the income inequality. Here? Okay. What's the cause of the income inequality? And a major cause is the tax system. So for the typical worker, uh, say a third of his income is taxed away, right? So the tax pushes down his wage. And then the government gets uh, revenue and it provides public goods. And these public goods end up increasing land value and land rent. The public goods like security, better fire protection, schools, uh, highways, and so on, make locations more productive and more attractive. That increases the demand to be there. It increases the rent and land value, right? Uh, so the typical worker tenant gets double billed. He pays a higher rent to be located in good locations, and he pays taxes to pay for the public goods. If the worker tenant is double billed, somebody is getting subsidized, and that is the landowner. The landowner uh, gets higher rent and land value from taxes paid for mostly by labor, right? So that's an implicit subsidy, and that subsidy pushes up the value of land and, and housing. So the reason people can't afford housing is because their wage has been pushed down and the uh, value of uh, land has been pushed up, right? So a land value tax uh, cures that, right? If we don't tax your wage at all, you get to keep your entire wage, and you also keep whatever interest you get from savings. You keep your wage, and the taxes on all landowners according to the land value. So that stops the subsidy, right? So that raises the wages, and you keep your whole wage, and reduces uh, housing costs, and now people can afford housing. So it's equitable because it pays back value received. It's also efficient because if you tax labor, you get less labor. If you tax uh, capital, you get less capital. If you tax, tax land, right, does the land shrink? Or maybe the land will flee the country? Or maybe the land will hide so you can't see it? Well, the land does not shrink, flee, or hide, right? So therefore, and because land is inherently visible, so therefore uh, the taxation of land is efficient. It doesn't raise the rent. It doesn't raise the price of products produced on the land. Right? So it's equitable and efficient. There's one more bonus from taxing land value, and that is it prevents the business cycle. You say, well, how does it do that? Well, uh, the reason you have a business cycle is because you have the real estate cycle. I've done a study of uh, real estate cycles, and every major depression for the past 200 years has been preceded by peaks in the real estate cycle, both in land value and uh, construction, and that includes the recession of 2008. Right? So uh, if you tax most of the value of land, right, then that eliminates the excessive land speculation and the, the rise of uh, land values, which then is unsustainable and then crashes and brings down the banking system with it. We had that before in 1990 with savings and loans, and they had to be bailed out, or they were bailed out, but we don't, we don't seem to learn. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> land value taxation equalizes income without reducing productivity. It doesn't have a dead weight loss or excess burden or loss of uh, well-being. And third, it uh, eliminates the business cycle. Oh, one more advantage, that is land creates an efficient use of land. It prevents urban sprawl because it, it infills the city center. 
because the, the value is based on the potential rent of land, not one what uh, the rent happens to be from a particular tenant. So therefore, if you have a vacant lot in the middle of a city next to a tall building, the value of the land is the same. So that landowner will be pushed to infill, to put up a tall building so it's worth paying the tax. Uh, so what's not to like? Uh, so thank you, Dr. Fulberry. Um, so next we're going to go with uh, Dr. Bellman. Um, uh, yeah, so let, let us know a bit about yourself and what your views on the, the optimal taxation are. All right, so I'm uh, Yaron Bauman, I'm an environmental economist. I'm here to talk about, about carbon taxes. Uh, one thing I will say for carbon taxes, and I'm curious to hear the land value folks or others uh, opine about this, is carbon tax or an environmental tax more generally is the kind of tax you want to have even if you don't need government revenue for anything, uh, which is kind of cool. So how does that work? Um, it actually builds off of this slide from my little comedy show where we talk about trade making everyone worse off. It's actually possible in a theoretical situation at least to have trade make everyone worse off. And here's a real simple example of this, right? Let's just take a real, it's a simple three person externality model. So we're just gonna have these three people called orange, pink, and blue. They all live in a small town. They all, small town has an air pollution problem. And, uh, and each have a garage full of stuff that they don't use. All right, so we're gonna see some trades between them. So first, Orange is gonna sell a lawnmower to Pink, and the story I'm gonna tell you is that they each get $100 in value from that trade. Orange sells his lawnmower she's not using for $100. Pink maybe would be willing to pay $200 for a lawnmower. She only has to pay $100, so she gets $100 in net benefits. The challenge is that when, uh, when uh, Pink starts using the lawnmower, lawnmowers create a little bit of air pollution. Maybe you can see a little bit of haze around the town. And uh, like I said, made up economic story, maybe we can monetize the health impacts from asthma, lost days of work in school, stuff like that, at $80 per person, right? Not just for orange and pink, but also for blue. So the impact on blue is what economists call a negative externality, right? Because blue is external to the trade between orange and pink. But note that orange and pink each get $20 in net benefits from that trade. They may not know about blue, they may not care about blue, so that trade could still make sense to them. So you can tell a very similar story with some more trades. Pink is gonna sell a motorcycle to blue. Again, they each get $100 in benefits, but air pollution gets worse, another $80 in healthcare costs for everybody. And then you just complete the circle. Orange sells a chainsaw, or blue sells a chainsaw to orange. Don't ask why. They each get $100 in benefits, air pollution gets worse, another $80 in healthcare costs for everybody. And what's interesting is that for all three of those trades together, everybody ends up at minus 40. All right, so this is the tragedy of the commons, the prisoner's dilemma, if those ideas are familiar to you. And the economics is that each person's trades are individually rational, right? They each get $20 in net benefits from each trade that they make. So if you ask them if they want to take back any of the trades that they make, they'll say no, because each trade they make leaves them $20 better off. But altogether, the trades end up hurting everybody. If you want to belabor the point and make a connection to climate change, you could, I don't know, like label the people. Right, and this is in broad strokes what economists are concerned about when it comes to climate change. So everything you need to know about climate change in just a couple of slides, right? We have carbon concentrations in the atmosphere going up, primarily caused by human activity. Then we have this theory that says if carbon concentrations go up, global temperatures are going to go up. This theory goes uh, back more than 100 years. It, it predates Al Gore. Uh, and uh, uh, and we've, we've been running this experiment on planet Earth for the last 150 years or so, and here are the results of the experiment. The blue dots are global average temperature measures for individual years. The red bars are 10-year averages from the 1880s up to the 1970s. And then there's the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s. For what it's worth, the first half of this decade, temperatures, I would argue, going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. And the way economists look at this, of course, is that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Because when you make polluting expensive, you get market forces working to promote conservation, innovation, development of new technologies, all the things that I, as an economist, love about capitalism. Right, so what I work on as an environmental economist is using the tools of economics and the power of capitalism to protect the environment with a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system. Right, and the point of those policies is to drive up the price of fossil fuels. Not always the easiest sell in the world, but there is a side benefit to these policies other than the main benefit if you know potentially saving the planet. Uh, and the side benefit is if you do these policies right, you generate a pile of revenue. 
and do all sorts of things with that revenue, but the idea that I work on and talk to folks about is that we could be using most or all of that revenue to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform, tax shifting, revenue neutral tax swaps. The idea being basically that we had higher taxes on things we want less of, like carbon emissions, then we could afford to have lower taxes on things we want more of, like jobs and income and savings and investment. British Columbia is actually a, a fine example of this. They have probably the best climate policy in the world, a revenue neutral carbon tax, tax on carbon emissions, they lower the income tax. Um, California has a cap and trade system. I will give you my joke version of why I like the carbon tax better. The BC carbon tax is so simple and transparent, you can describe it with a haiku. So here's my carbon tax haiku. It's a fossil CO2, $30 for each ton, revenue neutral. <laughs> ah. California's cap and trade system, I would argue, is a little bit more like war and peace. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad, it's just complicated. Uh, so that's kind of why I like the BC approach better. I'm actually part of, a, I'm the co-chair of a campaign in Washington State, an initiative that will be on the ballot this November, Initiative 732, to bring a BC-style carbon tax to Washington State. Our basic policy is to replace part of the state sales tax with a carbon tax. We also reduce some business taxes for manufacturers so that they stay competitive, and we fund a, an earned income tax credit benefit for low-income households. So if you're interested in learning more about that, then the website for the campaign is yeson732.org. And thank you so much for including me in this panel. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, next we'll go to Robin Hansen. Oh, you want to be last? Oh, OK. Next we'll go to uh, jo Joshua Vincent then. Jo Joshua Vincent is uh, with the Center for the Study of Economics. He, he goes around the country advocating for tax reforms at municipal levels. All right. I, did, I was going to describe myself, but thank <laughs> you. You did it. Uh, we've been around. We're going to. I'm not going to use very many of these slides, but as uh, uh, Edward said, we run a nonprofit foundation. We've been around since approximately 1926, and we try to talk about the idea of using alternative forms of taxation to achieve a lot of concrete and uh, scalable and uh, repeatable goals across the country and across the nation. And that is to stop taxing what we do and what we make and what we dream for, what we exchange for, and instead use a revenue source that is always been there and in the Bay Area it's particularly important to talk about it and in the context of this conversation that we're having today it's a way for people to also get gainful employment I'm one of about 20 people that make a living in the world doing land value tax and there's room for a lot more there's never enough uh, time for myself or people in Australia New Zealand uh, China Denmark etc I'm really going to stick with just one slide since we have 10 minutes, but this is our world as it is today, and it's kind of sad because we're defeating ourselves day in, day out, and in the foreseeable future, with the advent of more and more technology and an incredible nearly science fiction, uh, but it will, it will happen, vision of the future where we as humans sort of seem to become surplus. We have to find a way for people without work, for people with no hope of remunerative work, are still able to receive what they need to survive and to thrive as human beings. Our current tax system is like the poor little girl on the tree limb. We're, uh, we're paying, uh, for example, in the Bay Area sales taxes to help pay for transportation. Well, that hits the people that are least able to pay. Uh, we hate sales taxes. We think that wage taxes are not a good idea simply because the truly wealthy don't pay wage taxes. We do, the suckers. And so there is an alternative, and it's an alternative that can be popular. Uh, again, I'm going to fly through these slides but you look at the value on this planet that is residing uh, untouched and untapped by the community and also cuts individuals off from the community. This happens to be 
uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and that was for a while one of the most expensive houses uh, for sale in the United States. Uh, for sale for $140 million, but they wangled uh, a special privilege uh, and, in, and an incentive to turn it into agricultural land. Obviously, they never intended it for it to be used as a forest preserve, but that's what it was zoned as. That's money lost to the public, and it's our job, all of us, to get that revenue back. Now, again, I'm going to race a little bit because we have a lot to talk about, but you have the Big Dig in Boston. Now, the Big Dig in Boston was paid for by every licensed practical nurse, every uh, gas jockey, um, and everybody else in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not to uh, talk about the subsidies provided by the federal government, all of us, the taxpayers. And so they buried uh, in Boston an ancient, ugly, and uh, value-reducing highway system, and they put it below ground. Now, when they put it below ground at the cost of almost uh, se well, several billions of dollars, paid for by the government, in other words, paid for by us, who benefited? Qui bono? Obviously, the surrounding re uh, commercial properties uh, benefited dramatically. Uh, in Boston as a whole, uh, commercial value went up about uh, 41%, but around the Big Dig area, it went up 79% after completion. Why? Because we paid to make the land better, and we did it through public investment. They benefited, and the public barely benefited. That's something that we want to turn around. And in the Bay Area, we really need that kind of focus on collecting that which is public and keeping things private which are truly private. So there's a lot of examples about how our current tax system doesn't work, and I'll stop uh, at the end of this. There's the city of Baltimore in Maryland. That's the real property tax rate, the effective tax rate. It's uh, about 2.2%. And every other county in Maryland has tax rates that are much, much lower. How then does Baltimore City get people and businesses? Well, they don't. People have left. The city is uh, shrinking, especially the urban core unless they give away tax subsidies, abatements, and giveaways. And that's no way for a city to thrive by continually blowing a hole in their budget. If we tax the land value, people would build whatever they want and they wouldn't be taxed on it. Uh, wage taxes. I live in the city, live and work in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the total tax on wages is 7%. It's also a flat regressive tax, which is very rare. It's not, it's not a, a, a graduated income tax. So if you're in the city of Philadelphia, you pay 7%. Elsewhere, you pay 3%. People that have the means have left. And again, there's Hartford, Connecticut, which used to be the fifth wealthiest city in the United States, almost within living memory, uh, around 1910 when Mark Twain lived there. And now it has an effective tax rate of almost 3.5%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but over the course of 10 years, if you own a house in Hartford, that amounts to an excise tax of about 35% of the home's value. So that's what we're trying to reduce. And I think I can skip the rest of it for the uh, purposes of time. And we can, we can talk and really have a conversation about where we can go on this especially in a, in a place where the differences between the privileged and the non-privileged are so great and so incredibly uh, uh, divergent. So I want to thank you very much, and uh, I'm going to pass it right on and turn this off. All right. All right. Or not. The next uh, speaker panelist is Chris Nelson of Common Ground. Thank you, Ed. Nice to be here in California from rainy and dismal, dark Portland, Oregon. 
<laughs> has been hot, but it's been dismal and awful lately, so don't come. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, I'd uh, like to take off on Josh's remarks about uh, land value taxation's effects and uh, specifically talk about uh, a way to fund transportation, namely transit, by collecting the publicly created values in land uh, through a, a special tool. Um, but I'd also like to talk about that in the context of uh, how to solve this terrible problem we're having with uh, the property tax limitations, both in California and in Oregon. So uh, these are uh, two strategies. But first, I'd like to a little bit know a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on uh, the property tax limitation here in California. Uh, how many of you pay California property taxes? Wow. Okay, so about half, maybe. Uh huh. Um, and can anyone tell me what Proposition 13 did? Yes, sir. In the middle. Proposition 13 kept your uh, depreciation of the assessed value of your land to be uh, much less than the market rate, so that your taxes would not increase significantly while you owned the property, but purchase a new property would pay tax on the market value of your property. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Yes. Okay, reiterate the question. So my neighbor, who's had around 40 years, uh, with the same lot as mine, pays significantly lower taxes than I do, and I pay significantly lower taxes than my other neighbor who bought the house for free. Okay. For the same So essentially, it imposed a limit on the rates at which property taxes could increase. Fair enough? Okay, and yes, uh, anything else? Uh, thank you. Uh, just briefly, what I thought I heard was uh, the, the local government ended up having its own uh, restrictions on values of land and, uh, and transfer of land and its uh, appreciation. Was there one more? Yes, thank you. Assessed value. I'm glad you said assessed value because one of the key things that it revoked was use of fair market values until uh, sale, right? There's a reset on sale of the taxes you're paid, but in the meantime, there's no actual annual fair market value assessment going on. So basically, we threw you know, rationality to the wind in terms of keeping a consistent uh, fair market value rate. Well, in talking with Fred uh, Fulvery earlier, I also discovered, much like in Oregon, but slightly different, Proposition 13 also has been documented to shift a lot of the tax burden from the commercial sector onto the residential sector. And this is in part due to this reset on values because the turnover rate of commercial properties is much slower than in residential. So in order to meet the same tax revenues, well, you know, the burden and tax collections ended up being more in residential. Well, it's very similar to what happened in Oregon. Um, in Oregon, uh, we discovered something similar but slightly different, and that is that uh, measures 5 and 50 
shifted property tax burden from high value properties onto lower value properties. So guess what that means? <laughs> Those less able to pay are taking more of the burden. Does that smack of regressivity? Well, I'd say so. Well, so we've got some really serious problems with the property tax while we seem to understand that, gee, there's a great way to green the property tax and address these equity issues, namely with the land value taxation. But how the hell do we get there when everybody is so afraid of changing the property tax limitations? I mean, it's the same in California as in Oregon, I believe, where even labor and those progressive groups who would love to see more progressive property tax are afraid to touch it because it's too politically volatile. So how do we crack this? Well, one way to crack it might be through showing in actual studies and actual data what works. So why don't we introduce a bill to the legislature that actually studies the economic and equity effects of a local option land value tax, much as what Pennsylvania has, where local cities can adopt their own split rate, higher rate on land and lower rate on buildings for a revenue neutral basis. So, since 2007, my colleagues and I in, in Oregon have been introducing constitutional amendment referral bills. And guess what? We discovered there's bipartisan support for this idea. But do you think they want to actually vote for something that would refer the constitutional amendment? No. It's too volatile. They can't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So how do we get there? Well, um, in two sessions ago, in 13 session, we introduced a study bill, and lo and behold, we had bipartisan support for the bill on the House side. But then last session, in uh, 15, we managed to get a study bill out of the Senate Finance Committee, and it withered in ways and means. But we pointed out that there was actually pretty broad support for the idea, except they don't understand it. <laughs> they just don't get it. So we really needed to do some more example searching. And what we've come up with is the idea of showing how transit can be funded through a twist on a local improvement district and by capturing the local station area land value increases to fund that transit, then we can see that land values from publicly created activities such as upzoning, infrastructure investment, and particularly if you're investing in infrastructure that in further improves the land values such as in known as transit oriented development you know fancy term for hey let's help pedestrians and bicyclists and affordable housing develop around transit stations so uh, we now have finally after several years of uh, discussions with portland streetcar just learned uh, this past week that uh, they're ready to fund a feasibility study on creating a transit benefit district to fund a streetcar line in Portland. But the other discovery we made was that transit benefit districts, unlike a local improvement district that collects both a, an assessment on the improvements and an assessment on the land, doesn't need a constitutional amendment. In fact, it doesn't even need a statutory change. What it needs is a local ordinance change. Yeah. So we think that almost any community can actually adopt this with a small change in the rules for a local improvement district. And I have a one-page yeah. flyer yeah. here. Yeah. I'll pass around if anybody would like more information about this crazy idea. <laughs> 
please add your name and, and email address, and I'll collect it later. Th thank you, Chris. Yeah, so um, it's, it's uh, an interesting problem because it's both uh, national and local. It's even a global problem. And, uh, but it's, it's of particular irrelevance here in California where the highest foreclosure rates were seen after the 2008 recession. Uh, this is, uh, we believe, uh, seems uh, from the speakers uh, that a, a, a lot of it must be due to Proposition 13. Um, and regardless of whether the property taxes ought to be higher or lower, the restrictions seem to, seem to create a lot of dislocation effects and, and stifling of movement and so on. Um, so uh, coming in with perhaps some more, uh, uh, some critiques of all of these, um, would, is Robin Hansen, uh, pr professor at George Mason. So, uh, hello. I'm happy to endorse the general principles of my fellow economists. Uh, one, that arbitrary differences in prices uh, distort behavior. Two, that uh, negative externalities should be taxed. And three, that if you have to tax something that isn't a negative externality, tax something that has a very low elasticity. Uh, those are fine uh, general principles to adopt. However, uh, You'll probably notice that most lobbyists don't much care about the general principles embodied in law. <laughs> uh, they're really happy to uh, let you write your own general principles as long as they get to work out the details, in particular the details that agencies work out, because it's those details that really make most of the difference. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you have to worry that since the public can hardly be persuaded that we economists even have decent principles here, uh, that these uh, typical swing voter isn't really sure what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> It's a question whether uh, if we propose a general principle and then we propose some implementation details, whether we will have good implementation details such that the public would insist that those details are the ones that get implemented so that it actually works out right. So the key point is the details matter a lot. So for example, uh, in the carbon trading world, uh, there have been many famous examples of iffy carbon credits, credits for basically like not burning down your forest, say. Uh, because, hey, that would cause a lot of carbon. I didn't do it, so I should deserve a big tax credit, <laughs> right? You have to figure out those things uh, for land valuation, of course. Uh, you have to value not only the overall property, you have to break that into the value of the land plus the value of the improvements. Uh, that's hard. And again, there are, of course, reasonable ways that a reasonable economist could do these things, but <laughs> the question is whether actual law will do the reasonable thing or whether the, if you endorse this general principle, what actually ends up happening is some complicated amalgam that makes things worse or no better and just makes changes. So uh, I, as an economist or even a political theorist, am more interested in looking for very simple proposals <laughs> such that it's really hard to screw it up. <laughs> uh, such that uh, it's pretty transparent that even if you hand this over to some uh, inefficient or even corrupt political agency that uh, it won't go too far wrong. <laughs> Right. So, uh, can you think of any examples of uh, tax shifts in history, uh, recent or, or uh, not recent history, that ha ha have made a significant improvement in people's lives, uh, whether in your field of, of healthcare or, other, or any other field? Again, uh, I'm happy to endorse all the usual principles <laughs> about supporting things. The, the issue is about the complexity. So, on the margin, uh, there is, you should prefer a little, uh, things that are just simple and clean, maybe over things that have a better principles if you're really worried about how they'll be implemented. So uh, it, traditionally, sales taxes and even income taxes have been not so corruptible mm. uh, because there's fewer judgments to be made there. About, you know, if it's a percentage of the sale price or uh, auctions are also a great way to raise revenue. Uh, open up something to the highest bidder and give it to the highest bidder at that price rather than right. negotiating some detail with special so, insiders. Uh, there's an example of that with um, the electromagnetic spectrum. The FCC right. aux auctions off the rights to particular bandwidths and uh, th these auctions can get to a fairly decent high rate and be a, a source of revenue for, for right. uh, I, and I happen government. to know a bit about the insider process of the spectrum auction, and I know they couldn't, they could have raised more revenue <laughs> had yes. they done it in a more straightforward, simple way. They added more complicated rules that helped various inside lobbyists at the expense of the overall revenue. Right.
Meridian of Scott's Corn. Now, that's a long time ago, but the 20th century idea of auction expectancy. Right. But the simple idea is if there's a property that should exist, just put it up for auction <laughs> rather than doing something complicated. But again, my main message is let's endorse standard economic principles fine, but let's also realize that the, the devil's in the details and economists often neglect the details. And it, it's worth something to do something simple and clean so that it doesn't get messed up. Um, may, may I respond? Uh, yes, uh, yes, go, uh, Josh. It's a really good point because public policy is, of course, where the, the rubber meets the road to, to use the cliche. And many cities have enacted this in and, and many uh, international cities and so on. And the question is, and we're going to have a session later on assessment, and that the devil is in the detail, and most often uh, those are really screwed up. So we're balancing the efficiency of a sales tax, which is probably in, in our country the most efficient tax, but in Philadelphia, we just enacted uh, a, a, an excise tax on sugary drinks. And everybody said it's for the children and, of course, the, the swing votes that uh, our colleague brought up so importantly had said, oh, it's for the children. Now, of course, uh, in Philadelphia, the year before, we enacted a cigarette sales tax. And it didn't raise the $75 million predicted. It raised about $45 million in one year. And anecdotally and factually, cigarette sales in the immediate surrounding counties increased. Uh, one of our land value tax towns opened up three cigarette shops because it's within walking distance of Philadelphia. Yeah. So as far as efficiency goes, they're easy to administer. But the, uh, the leakage is um, what I think the land no, tax Now, a few things, with. though, is some taxes actually uh, uh, push off the costs to the private sector, so they're just hidden. So like with sales tax, you have all these implementations of the tax code in private point-of-sale systems and so on. Uh, which creates, uh, according to Ronald Coase, barriers to entry into new markets. Um, and then you also, with uh, uh, carbon tax, the, the variant of ca cap and trade, I've heard uh, by Annie Leonard uh, uh, being perhaps so bankrupt and so, so, so badly implemented in so, some districts that it actually worsens pollution while enriching people because of the the particular implementation details. Uh, uh, and she, Annie Leonard is the woman who did the story of stuff video about uh, global warming. So uh, the the simplicity when you showed the uh, your arm uh, Bauman when you showed the um, war and peace versus the haiku, that that simplicity issue seems really pertinent right there. As far as implementation. <clears throat> The income tax code is 70,000 pages. And people, Americans spend uh, billions of hours every year uh, keeping records and calculating the income tax. With a, with a property tax and especially a land tax, they send you a bill and you pay it, preferably monthly. Now, there are examples of uh, communities and countries which have implemented uh, land value tax. Uh, Arden, Delaware was founded by followers of Henry George in 1900, specifically to demonstrate the feasibility of using land rent for public revenue. They have a board of assessors, they assess the land value, and then the people, it's owned by a trust, people pay it, so it works. In other words, you know, maybe in theory it can't work, but in practice it does, all right? <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, now, uh, in, in China there was a colony called Kiao Chao, whose capital was Tsingdao. Nowadays, it's called Qingdao. And uh, it's right on the ocean. And they had uh, some of the Olympics over there. It was founded by the Germans in 1898. Uh, at that time, Germany was establishing whatever colonies they could. Uh, the governor happened to be a, uh, a member of the German Land Reform League. And he could pretty much do what he wanted, because he was far away from Germany. So he put in a 6% land value tax. And from 1990, 1898 to 1914, Qingdao developed into a beautiful modern city. It was a fishing village in 1898. Uh, other countries that have implemented it successfully include uh, Taiwan, uh, Denmark, 
uh, Australian cities. So in other words, it's not like it hasn't been tried. And uh, I don't know anywhere that it's, it's been implemented where it has not been successful. On the income tax complexity, it started out simple. Yeah. But because it was the main source of revenue, that's where people lobbied to get their special exemptions. If right. you had most of the revenue coming from a land tax, I predict over time, even if it starts simple, it'll end up complicated because that's where the lobbyists will go. Yeah, well, we have uh, something like 100,000 people working for the IRS, is that correct? Uh, so uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem very simple at the moment. So um, Yeah, and I, I was interested more in the, in the details of the different cap and trade versus carbon tax. Uh, if, if, if someone could uh, make that apparent, like my understanding is perhaps sometimes it's the uh, c carbon credits are allocated based on how much you've been historically polluting, which is a little strange. So um, I'm, maybe there's other ways that we could think of cap and trade where it might not be as bad as that or? Yeah, so um, I mean, you, economists tend to think about carbon taxes and cap and trade system as, 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 as quite similar to a first approximation. Anything you can do with one, you can do with the other. Uh, carbon taxes tend to be a little more simple and transparent, which politically could be good or bad, but anything you do with one, you can pretty much do with the other. So you have offsets that, that you and Robin talked about with cap and trade systems. You could potentially do the same thing with a carbon tax if you had a negative carbon tax and paid people if their forest didn't burn down or whatever that you're <laughs> providing offsets for. Um, so, uh, you know, the way that you mentioned that, that um, cap and trade permits are sometimes allocated based on historic emissions. If you auctioned off the permits, then you know you wouldn't get that result, and you'd end up with something that's very similar to a carbon tax. So either policy can be done well, either policy can be done badly. And uh, part of what we're learning in Washington State is that there's really no alternative to kind of going out and trying it, um, painful though it may be. So our ballot measure is, uh, we think it's a pretty great ballot measure, but it's being opposed by some of the environmental groups in the state and uh, kind of in interesting political bedfellows um, that makes no sense. With with uh, with the carbon tax, no, it, it it yeah, pretty much you're right. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it's, it's the Koch brothers. There's, <laughs> you know, but I, I think what's interesting is that both the idea of environmental taxes, which are sometimes called Pigovian taxes, after the economist who wrote about this in 1920, and land value taxes, which go back even farther, um, uh, are. I think, do they go back farther? When was, when yeah, was the, Progress the and Poverty? The French physiocrats wrote about the Ampa Unique, the uh, single tax on land back in the 1700s. All right, mm -hmm. so, you know, what's interesting is that, that, that it's so hard to get these ideas into practice. Um, and that's, that's the challenge. You know, I think, I think in theory, you get a lot of folks who have agreement about things, and in practice, uh, the political system is tricky. Now, uh, as far as other types of um, uh, ecological taxes, I understand uh, uh, some people are concerned about things like soil depletion or water p pollution or, uh, you know, p perhaps uh, other, other kinds of uh, more specific problems. And with these, uh, I, I was speaking earlier with a gentleman who was talking about the difficulty of tracing things like who is causing soil depletion and causing runoff and all this. Uh, do you know of any interesting uh, economic solutions to more those more side questions? Um, well, if you want to tax something, then you have to be able to measure it. So mm -hmm. if it's not measurable, then it's pretty hard to, to, to put a tax on it. Um, carbon emissions, are, are kind of nice in that way because the amount of carbon that comes from burning a fossil fuel is just proportional to the amount of fossil fuel. Uh, you know, there's a set ratio for coal and different types of coal, but for natural gas and for, for gasoline, for example, it's 19.6 pounds of CO2 per gallon. And that's the same whether you burn it in a Volkswagen bus or in a Toyota Prius. Um, other taxes, you know, it's, it's possible to do them in theory, but it's, it's a lot more challenging. And, you, you know, you, you see that when you think about, like, well, what if we did all greenhouse gases and wanted to tax methane from cow burps? Then that becomes more of a measurement problem unless you can identify that each cow is going to give out, you know, this much methane per day or whatever. We're, we're going to open it up now to questions and answers from, the, from the, everyone. All right, go ahead. Okay, yeah, uh, what is your opinion on uh, Wall Street? 
question was about Wall, Wall Street, Street taxes. Wall Street taxes. Wall Street. Oh. That's not even very high. Uh, does anyone have any any opinions on like uh, financial transactions taxes? Uh, a tax on financial transactions has been proposed on uh, uh, transfers of stock or, or derivatives and so on. Uh, well, first of all, I would ask, what's the problem if somebody buys the shares of stock or bonds or? Uh, some uh, other kinds of financial trans transactions, futures markets, options. What is the problem? Uh, people look at Wall Street and say, well, that's the problem. Uh, Wall Street is the, you know, Wall Street does not force me to have an account with a brokerage firm or, or a bank. Now, if they're getting subsidies, that's a problem, but that's a government problem, uh, not Wall Street as such. Now, they have political clout, and then they get subsidies, all right, so that's a political problem, uh, uh, just like agricultural gets subsidies, and uh, there's all kinds of special interests that get uh, have political clout. So, uh, if that's the problem, then change the political system. Our system is mass democracy, which inherently has flaws, and there's no way to fix it except to replace it with a better kind of democracy. So I don't I don't see the Wall Street as such being a, a problem. And if you do tax Wall Street. Financial transactions will move over to London. They'll be happy to have them. Um, does anyone else uh, have any thoughts on the democratic process or uh, how financial transactions or capital gains ought to uh, be uh, determined? Well, capital gains tax or capital gains can often be ascribed pretty accurately to, and correct me if I'm wrong to land value gains, to uh, the third factor of production, land. And yeah. Well, you can have capital gains from capital also, from mm -hmm. stocks or yeah. other and things. So if you split, out, split them out, which shouldn't be terribly sophisticated, I mean, too sophisticated for me, but it can be done because capital gains are, so much of them are actually land value gains. The home mortgage deduction. Right. I didn't hear it. Uh, they're, they're asking what, they, what, what are the thoughts on the, on the mortgage interest tax deduction. Well, it's, it's, it's distorting. We don't need it, I, I, in my person. It's, it's, it's an interest But it's, right? a middle, it's, yeah. it's the only uh, piece of candy uh, the middle class gets, but it, it feeds into that mania that a house is an investment. The ownership society. Yeah, and instead of treating a house what it is, shelter. So, yeah. no, it's not, I don't Real I don't estate like gets all kinds of uh, tax breaks that other kinds of property don't. Besides the mortgage interest deduction, you get the property tax deduction. If you own the house, when you sell it, you have a $500,000 exemption from capital gains taxes. If you don't live in the house and you own it, for income property or speculation, you can you can sell it without any capital gains tax if you buy a similar property, like a property exchange, and you get to deduct the depreciation, which is a legal fiction, because it's not the real economic depreciation of loss of value of the building. It's just a certain number of years that you can uh, deduct uh, deduct away the whole value of the building, and then you sell the property, and the new owner deducts it all over again. So that is uh, the various tax breaks that real estate gets that other property doesn't get. And that's why, as I said, uh, you have a huge implicit subsidy to land values that you don't have in other properties. So most of the time when the legal system in taxes has A and B treated differently, and you ask, is there a good economic rationale for that? The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> so that means We've added this huge complexity to the system, which means ordinary people can't figure it out, and it distorts behavior, and it means people who figure out the rules better get advantages, and we economists, for the most part, say, you're not buying anything with that. <laughs> yeah. You're just messing it up. Yeah. When you're talking about land value taxation, there's kind of, you could divide it into natural resources on one side and location, which is a social a aspect on, on the other. Now, so, okay, thanks. So, 
we have other kinds of locations now, websites, for example. So um, how would you characterize Google, Facebook, and other um, web corporations that, in effect, are extremely large location owners? And how would you ta go about taxing them? So intellectual property is taxed. Uh, but it's usually taxed in the form of, after so many years, we take it away from you. <laughs> uh, so that's how we treat intellectual property taxes different than other property. Uh, some people tend to think uh, web domains also uh, are a form of like real estate. Uh, and uh, I can, uh, there is a contention as to who really controls it. Is, the, is it the US? Ought the UN control it? You know, um, and who should be charged and how much? Well, first of all, uh, webs, web names or locations are not really that limited a resource. You can create more web names. I have a website, fullberry.net. So, and now they've uh, expanded it. You can have various endings like .info and, and .us and so on. So, so it's not like a monopoly like uh, that natural land is. And, uh, and from my perspective, a website or web name is a capital good. It's not land. Uh, and so the, uh, I don't think it should be taxed. So, so, so like Facebook.com, you're saying, was not made valuable be, by the name Facebook, but by, because of Facebook's actions. Exactly. Okay. And, um, and look at look at MySpace. You know that that was valuable real estate for a while, and now it's it's gone. So it's it's not a naturally inherent occurring location. So uh, so let's we get have, a few more questions. We, have, we oh. only have like two minutes left, so okay. I'm sorry. This has to be the last one. Okay. Follow up with the speakers. Okay. I'm going to okay. hold it for you. Okay. So in a way, uh, California has a uh, land value tax in the example of the Port of San Diego collects ground rent. So uh, can't we build on that model? And is it true that the other ports also collect a ground rent? as their main uh, source of revenue. And incidentally, the uh, Port of San Diego is a very successful, very well-run organization. They don't charge any sales tax or income taxes. They get all the revenue from ground rent. So yay, Port of San Diego. Yeah, I believe that the Port of Portland also has a similar uh, taxation system. And I've heard of other ports uh, leasing property only based on uh, the land value of the leasehold. And marinas, I think, usually work that way too. Right. right. Um, and I thought I'd offer another example that's probably used here in California as well as in Oregon, and that is an enterprise zone. Perhaps you're familiar with this incentive. It's usually short term. Usually, well, in Oregon it's five years, but it essentially abates the tax on the improvements to encourage investment. Lo and behold, it actually encourages investment. <laughs> so while it's temporary, the principle is practiced fairly widespread, I believe. And actually the downfall of uh, an enterprise zone or uh, anything like that, or, or uh, I want to talk about the ground rent actually, is that of course the landowner re realizes that he can capitalize his land uh, asking price into a higher price because we're, we're giving away an abatement on the, on the uh, front end. A 10 year tax abatement means, oh, I'm going to charge double for the plot. But a lot of uh, government authorities, port authorities, uh, New York, uh, quasi-governmental uh, privileges given out, like the railroads, in the 1800s, ground rent was uh, a way to kickstart and to maintain things, uh, to maintain operations. And Maryland, of all places, has a ground rent system, but it's entirely privatized, and it has no relation to the actual economy or the actual location. Just an FYI. The, the, Ground rents are a great term because people understand it. I'd, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Uh, this is the concludes our panel. Thank you.